خون رو من ببین ما چه تو آر فالورز به سبسکرایبرز اشه سی Thank you for visiting my channel. Today we're gonna be going back into Noah. So I've already made this video, but it was corrupted. So now I'm here to make it again. Enjoy. Those giants spend all their days making for themselves shields, armors, and weapons. At that time there were many astrologers and soothsayers who had predicted the coming destruction of the world and those prophecies were engraved into pillars and marble monuments. So where can we find astrologers and soothsayers in America in ancient times? Another question is can we find pillars and columns? in America. Hmm? Well, let's go and look. Uh, a place where apparently there used to be buildings up here, and if we go up, there's some interesting things you can see up there, the rock formation. What's interesting, what I'd like to point out is that when you find them like this, and here's one here, it looks like a pillar. I think it was formed by a human thousands of years ago. Some of these just don't look like they're natural. They look more man-made. Anyway, we'll just go on up and we'll see some other things. These two very similar. Um, and they're rounded all the way down and rounded on the bottom. And same here, just, just the round stone. There's something that's really interesting here. I can get this out. <laughs> All right, I can kind of show this. You see how this isn't. This is a round one here, but some some pattern that I keep finding is that there there there's a bowl like shape inside of it or on the top of it. Like see how it starts to go down in in a bowl here. And if I was to take this out. And, uh, you know, just take all this dirt out here. You can see how this thing starts to go down into a bowl. Um, so where it, and it'll be that way all the way around it, as you'll see, or you can see a little bit that I'm doing. I don't know if I'm going to completely take this out from under there. There's a lot of ground up there. But, but nonetheless, I think you can see what I'm talking about. This thing has a bowl-like shape. It kind of indents in. And then I find others, um, and I don't know if I can see one right around here anywhere close, that has the other, like this would be female, and then, then you have another one that has a little bit of a male um, in that fits perfectly. And you can see where they, you know, sometimes you can see where they broke apart. And, uh, and they break apart. You can find them like on this side. This side would have the male, which then goes out a little bit, which would fit in to, to another one like this. And then they just stack, stack on top of each other. And, and I got, we'll probably find some that we can show how that works later on. Um, I'll show how that actually works and how they stack on top of each other with that same pattern where they'll have a bowl and then they just fit right on top of each other perfectly. And I thought that was interesting. You see how they stack up on each other? It looks like they're melted together.
I know what you're gonna say and say, ah, uh, what you're just gonna show us videos? How are we supposed to believe this? It's all you do is show videos. Oh, well, let's read some. This is Woodhenge. Woodhenge is a circle of wooden posts at Kokyo Mounds, Illinois. It is west of Monk's Mound, which is the largest man-made earthen mound. Now let's, let's look at it, Monk's Mound. <laughs> now look at that. In America, okay. So you see, so this is Cahokia, and this would be the wood, wood hinge, like the stone hinge. Stonehenge counterpart found. Britain's megalith monument, Stonehenge, may have a North American counterpart. Recent excavations at Cahokia, the site of a thriving Indian civilization, about a thousand AD, have uncovered four huge circles of spaced wooden posts. The significance of the Indian woodhenge is considered to be akin to that of Stonehenge i.e. a solar calendar based on complicated geometry. Warren L. Wittry, assistant director of the Cranbrook Institute of Science in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, emphasized the importance of a post found just five feet east of True Center. An observer at the point in approximately 1000 AD would have seen the sunrise on midsummer day directly in the line of one of the, the hinge posts. So, and the books got them. So this is in the first, this is the history of the ancient American anterior to the time of Columbus. The first volume, page 143, in writing of pyramidal structure rising from the center of the temple of Copan in the following description that which was reserved for the details of that city to prove this contradiction on each side of the center of the steps is a mound of ruins apparently a circular tower about halfway up the steps of the pyramidal base on this side is a pit i.e. descent five feet square and 17 feet deep cased with stone at the bottom is an opening two feet four inches high with a wall one feet nine inches thick which leads to a chamber ten feet long five feet eight inches wide and four feet high at each end is a niche one foot nine inches high one foot eight inches deep and two feet five inches long. Colonel Galindo first broke into the sepulchre vault and found the niches in the ground full of red earthenware, dishes and pottery, Egyptian again, more than 50 of which he says were full of human bones packed in lime. Also several shaped edge and pointed knives of Chaya, a small death's head carved in fine green stone, its eyes nearly closed. The lower features distorted, the back symmetrically perforated with holes. The whole of exquisite workmanship. This last sentence brings us to a specimen of gem engraving. The most ancient of all the antique works of art. Not only is the death chamber identical with that of Egypt, but also the very way of reaching it. First, by ascending the pyramidal base, 
then descending and so entering the sepulchre. This could not be accidental. The builders of that pyramidal sepulchre must have had a knowledge of Egypt. The foregoing self-denial so valued in man under other aspects use all their virtue and exert it to sustain fallacious premises. It might be thought that enough has been brought forward to refute this conclusion, but we desire to operate upon this subject, as Tobin says, like the skillful surgeon who cuts deep beyond the wound to make a cure complete. Again, he writes, the column circles are distinguished features of Egyptian architecture. There is not a temple on the Nile without them, and the reader will bear in mind that among the whole of these ruins, not one column has been found. If this architecture had been derived from the Egyptians, so striking and important a feature would have been thrown aside. We admit the force of proceedings, so they're trying to say that if if Egyptian or Egyptian-like architect from people was in America, then for surely there would be there would be pillars and columns. I mean, for sure there would be there. So if it's not there, then you are blowing the smoke up the wrong tree. Right? So let's see. And they would have also be found in America if the edifices in that country were of or derived from Egypt. While we admit this reasoning, we at once deny the truth of the assertion that the round column has not been found in the ruins of ancient America. And that's what I go by. We have never found any columns in America. Those are savages. <laughs> All right, now let's read what it really says now. This denial is given upon the unimpeachable authority of Humboldt, who in his illustrations of the ruin of Mitla gives by writing as well as by pictorial description the circular columns distinct. The denial is also found upon the great authority of Mr. Stevens himself, for he as Baron Humboldt testifies to the fact both by pen and pencil. First we'll be quoting from his pen. In writings of ruins of Oxma, he says, at the southeast corner of this platform of the temple is a roll of round pillars 18 inches in diameter and three or four feet high extending about 100 feet along the platform and these were the nearest approach to pillars or columns that we saw in all our exploration of the ruins of that country now in the name of reason and all of its attributes could there be a nearer approach to circular columns than the round pillars are they not identical? The proposition can only be answered in an affirmative, and as a consequence, it becomes absolute from the identity. Again, again, in the middle of the terrace, along an avenue leading to a range of steps, was a broken round pillar, inclined and falling, with trees growing around it. We will now refer to his map, a ground plan of the Temple of Uxma, drawn by his artist, the accurate Catherwood, in volume 2, or volume II, page 428 to 29. On that plan, there are two rows of circular columns in parallel lines. One row is perfect and contains 11 columns. The other is imperfect and presents six columns. But as dotted on the plan and when the power lines were not in ruin, contained 22 round pillars. Though from the appearance of the ground plan, it is almost demonstrated that the two rows of columns were continued around the entire platform terrace, forming a grand colony like those of Palmyra or that facing the church of St. Peter's at Rome. But a square instead of a circular area. 
The columns at Uxmoor are given as 8 inches in diameter. This multiplied by 8, the medium calculation would give it would give each an altitude of 12 feet. On the plan, by measuring from the scale given, the line of one row of the column extends 140 feet in parallel the same. Each column is 10 feet from its associate. The same distance exactly is between the parallel rows, thus proving a perfect knowledge of architectural design. Perfect knowledge. Pursuing the same scale of measurement as the ground plan authorizes. The entire colonnade of Oxna contained originally 230 circular columns. See, now they're saying that, oh, it's just like the, the colonnades in Palmyra. Palmyra. So let's see what they look like in Palmyra. Boom. Boom. Huh? Boom. Right down. This is what you want to see. This is what they're talking about. Boom. Bada bing, bada boom, ba bang. Now, where can we see that? <laughs> Don't we? Doesn't it look something like. Hebrew Tabernacle. Maybe they'll show you one. The columns. Now let's see one in. They said the Temple of Oxma, right? Bada a beam, by the bam, ba bam. Columns, boom, 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 boom. Oh, if this is the people, they surely would have columns. Oh, surely they would have columns. And megalithic design. Oh, for surely, surely. Surely they would have this. In the center of the air in front of the temple uh, and holding the same locality as a single obelisk in front of St. Peter's of Rome is the ruins of a solitary, meaning a single, broken round pillar. Compared with other columns on the map, is 60 feet in diameter and this multiplied by 10 for capital and ornament on the summit, perhaps originally an emblem of the sun would give this angle column an altitude of 60 feet oh six feet in diameter sorry this is a circular not a square column the foregone architectural analysis is not given by Stephen but we have taken as a basis the rude ground plan given and have thus resuscitated resuscitated the colonnade of Oxma, which formed the approach to the great temple. On the map of the world now under consideration and directly beneath the round pillars, it is written the following sentence by Stevens himself to illustrate the meanings of the circular dots on the plan. The words are remains of columns. They say that the first terrace was 640 feet long on each of the four sides, five feet high. And it's all different types of diameters, and it shows you each one. Each 12 feet high and 8 inches in diameter in two rows, the columns 10 feet apart. So it's 10 feet by um, 18 by uh, was 12 feet high and they were t 
10 feet apart from each other. The base of the first terrace, 2,560 feet. Sculptured walls of the temple, 40,900 superficial feet. The three artificial terraces contain 72,800 cubic feet. Woo! How can he then reconcile from his own descriptions that not one column has been found? It says he, this architect, have been derived from the Egyptians. So striking and important a feature, i.e. circular columns, would never have been thrown aside. Well then, the important feature has not been thrown aside, and consequently, from his own reason, the architecture was derived from the Egyptians. We believe distinctly that the architecture was from, in all other words, borrowed from the edifices of the Nile, but not built but not built by the Egyptians themselves. In regard to another branch of art, he commits himself in the same manner as when writing of architecture. Next, as to the sepulcher, the idea of resemblance in this particular has been so often and so confidently expressed that I almost hesitate to declare the total want of similarity. So let's uh, move on. In that time. The first destruction was meant to happen by water and the second by fire. Important information and hints before we go further. The ruins of the city of Enos was discovered and seen even after the universal flood for a couple of hundred years. Few historians, including Berosus, have seen the ruins and two pillars that were planted by descendants of Seth, announcing the first destruction of the world by water and the second destruction by fire to the future generations. Now we all know that. And they just said that pillars were erected after the flood, before the flood, after the flood. We know that there's pillars all throughout America. We know Enos is in the mansion. We know that uh, <clears throat> uh, what is his name? the Greek historian. We know that the Greek historians' um, writings describes some of these Egyptian pyramids as connecting more to the ones in Mexico or America. Pharisees writes that Noah was a good giant and feared God. Him and his wife Titia preserved the laws given by God and they transferred the same to their children. Sem, Ham, Japhet were real nice boys and had great manners. Just like their father they respected the Creator. No 
were by God's command and also science of astrology, started to build a ship, because he was chosen by Creator to preserve humanity. On the April the 18th, Noah, who was 600 years old, entered the ark, and the world drowned. Noah and his family were saved when the ship by plans of God rested in Armenia on a mountain called Gordicus or Ararat, and he... Now if we look, Armenia, Ararat, yeah. This is where they said they landed, right? If we look in, into that, the Armenian, the name for Armenia is Hayastan. Hayastan is the name of the land. What you gotta realize is the name of the creator is Haya Haya. I am that I am. The, the, the characters used in Hebrew translates to Haya Haya. Okay? When we landed in, in Mount Ararat, the name of the creator was known because of the, because of the, um, Because of the covenant with Noah and the Creator, so Haya was known. And what did they call these people? They called these people the sons of Haya. Okay. So, oh yeah. so it's funny what they do here too. Began with ancient Indo-European and Eurotian origins. We are the people of Earth. Okay, Abraham was in, was from Earth. Okay, his his grandpa, his father were from Ur. They made gods. When we when you research Ur, and you realize they started in single god worship and eventually devolved into multiple god worship. And you can see it with this video right here. The university, he said, in his understanding, as a in Sumerian history. He said, the history of the oldest religion of man is a rapid decline from monotheism to extreme polytheism and a widespread belief in evil spirits. It is in a very true sense the history of the fall of man. And then we have... Do you hear that? The history of the fall of man. Let's listen to that again. of lots and lots of people just in a short period of time of 40 years getting involved in animism various forms of crystal healing therapy and spells and, and all that kind of thing very popular and it can happen quite rapidly if we look at um, Professor Langdon and, and isn't uh, that true though isn't that what's happening today it can happen very rapidly right are we all doing that now so animism magic had evolved through to polytheism, lots of gods, finally through to monotheism, one god creating everything. Uh, people like Fraser, uh, you may have read Fraser's book or come across it, The Golden Bough, he was one of those people. Tyler and Durkheim and others, they, they spoke about this kind of thing. However, what we find in the ancient religions, as time went on, as archaeologists dug, and as anthropologists studied amongst tribes, remote tribes, they found it was actually the opposite. They found a shadowy figure in the background who was a supreme creator, and that something had gone wrong, and it actually devolved, it's actually gone the opposite direction, and corrupted from a purer form through to polytheism, and through to simple magic and spells and so forth. In fact, if you look at today, even in our own time, what's called the New Age movement, um, we've seen that this country one time was very strongly monotheistic for the Christian. But since the 60s, in the last 40 years, there's been an amazing movement of lots and lots of people, just in a short period of time of 40 years, getting involved in animism, various forms of crystal healing therapy and spells and, and all that kind of thing, very popular. 
and it can happen quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. If we look at um, Professor Langdon, uh, he was an archaeologist from Oxford University. He said, in his understanding of the in Sumerian history, he said the history of the oldest religion of man is a rapid decline from monotheism to extreme polytheism and a widespread belief in evil spirits. It is in a very true sense the history of the fall of man. And then we have another uh, le leading anthropologist. This is um, Professor Evans Pritchard, again from Oxford University. Whereas before the... Sorry, uh, so we're going to go... Um, we got what we came for. So if you look at their gods in ancient Mesopotamia, their gods and that's worshiping the highest temple along Asur was high high. But they say God is but they keep saying he. He is the grain of grain he is the god of grain and scribe. If we look in etymology, scribes mean Jewish law. So that's the interpreter of Jewish law, scribal arts, interpretation of Jewish law. He's also known as the doorkeeper. He was the doorkeeper, meaning he got here's the judge. Keep you from uh, going in. Right? The judge. Ha ha. So if you look at this, you know. Um, we even seen that the La Brea Tar Pit shows you in America that anciently there was all these animals like camels, lions, mammoths, elephants, all of these different animals we don't associate with being in America are here in America long ago, long ago. And it's all been withdrew from your education. If you look at the Hawaiian culture, the, the legends following are a group of sunny islands lying almost midway between Asia and America, a cluster of volcanic craters and coral reefs where the mountains are mantled in perpetual green and look down upon valleys of internal springs where two, for two thirds of the year the trade winds sweeping down from the northward, the northwest coast of America and soften in their passes southward dally with the stateless cocos and spreading palms and mingle their cooling breath with their ever living fragrance of fruit and blossom deeply embosomed in the silent waste of the broad Pacific, with no habitable land nearer than 2,000 miles, these islands greet the eye of the approaching marina like a shadowy paradise, suddenly lifted from the depth, blue depths by the malicious spirits of the world of waters, either to lure him to his destruction or disappear as he drops his anchor by the enchanted shore. The legends of our little archipelago, which was unknown to the civilized world until the closing years of the last century, and the people who for many centuries exchanged no word or product with the rest of mankind, who had lost all knowledge, save the little retained by the dreamiest of, le of legends of the great world beyond their island home whose origin may be traced to the ancient Kushites of Arabia, and whose legends repeat the story of the Jewish genes Genesis who developed and passed through. An age of chivalry, somewhat more barbarous, but scarcely less affluent indeed, of enterprise and valor than which characterized the contemporaries contemporaneous races of the continental world, whose chiefs and priests claim kinship with the gods, 
and step by step told back their lineage not only to him who rolled the floods, but to the sinning pair whose re-entrance to the forfeited joys of paradise was prevented by the large white bird of Kane, Kane being the creator, who fought without shields and went to the death without fear, whose implements of war and industry were of wood, stone, and bone, yet who erected great temples to their gods and constructed barges and constructed barges and canoes which they navigated by the stars, who peopled the elements with spirits, reverenced the priesthood, bowed to the revelations of the prophets, and submitted without complaint to the oppressions of the taboo, who observed the rite of circumcision, built places of refuge after the manner of the ancient Israelites, and held sacred the religious legends of the priests of the chronological melees of the chiefs. As the mind reverts to the past of the Hawaiian group and dwells for a moment upon the shadowy history of its people, mighty forms rise and disappear, men of stature of eight or nine feet crowned with helmets of feathers and bearing spears thirty feet in length. Such men were Kiha and Lai Law and Umi and Lohi all kings of Hawaii during the 15th and 16th century, and little less in bulk and nonetheless in valor with the great Kamehameha, who conquered and consolidated the, the several islands under one government and died as late as 1819. Beside Umi, whose life was in romance, stands in humble friend Maka Leo Leo who with his feet upon the ground could reach the coconuts of standing trees. And back of him passed Sinkana, the son of Hina, whose height was measured by feet. And glancing still farther backward through the centuries, we behold adventurous chiefs in barges of double canoes, a hundred feet in length, making the journey between Hawaii and San Francisco, South America, and more southern groups divided only by the sun and the stars. Later we see battles with dusky thousands in line. The warriors are naked to the loins and are armed with spears, slings, clubs, battle axes, bow and arrows, javelins, knives, wood, and ivory. But they will tell you they neither had bows nor shields. They either catch but I can show you pictures that the Europeans drew of us with shields. They say we have born now, but they say we never like them because we like to sling them. Come on now. They either catch with their hand or ward with their own weapons that are thrown. The chiefs towering above them in stature have thrown off their gaudy feather cloaks and helmets, and with spears and stones and habit are at the front of the battle. The other forces are so dispossessed as to present a right and left wing at the center and the king of principal chiefs commanding the lady in person. In the rear of each hostile line are a large number, number of women with calabashes of food and water in which to refresh their battling fathers, husbands, and brothers. While the battle rages, their wails, cries, and prayers are incessant. And when defeat menaces their friends, they here or there take part in the combat. The augurs have been consulted, sacrifice and promises to God have been made, and as the warring lines approach, the war gods of the opposing chiefs, newly decorated and tended by long-haired priests, are borne to the front. War cries and shouts of defiance follow. The priests retire, and the slings and bow and arrows open the battle. Spears are thrown and soon the struggle is hand to hand all over the field. They fight in groups and squads around their chiefs and leaders who range the field in search of enemies worthy of their weapons. No quarter is given or expected. The first prisoners taken are reserved as offering to the gods. And are regarded as the most precious of sacrifices. Finally, the leading chief of one of the opposing army falls. A desperate struggle over his body ensues, and his desperate followers begin to give ground. 
and are soon in retreat, some escaping to the stronghold in the neighboring mountains, and a few perhaps to a temple of refuge, but most of them are overtaken and slain. The prisoners who are spared become the become the slaves of their captors and the victory is celebrated with feasting and bountiful sacrifices to the gods. Here we have given dates by Barathist who tells us this happened 830 years before foundation of Troy and 2,317 years before the birth of Christ. Now Noah was the monarch of the universe. He found himself a marvel and engraved and set down the universal flood as a historical event. This stone is preserved in Armenia, and it is called Miriadum, meaning issue of Adam by inhabitants of Armenia to this day. Noah begot thirty children from his wife Titia after the flood, one giant called Tuiscon and sixteen titans which all were giants, Prometheus. Japetus, Macru, Granors, Oceanus, and Tiphius. And Araxa, one of her daughters, was so named the Great, Regina, Pandora, Crana, and Thetis. In Armenia, Noah taught his children sacred theology, religion, and holy sacrifices, the human manners, secrets of nature, and he composed few books himself. So he, he taught secrets of nature, human manners, sacrifices, theology, religion. He also made books. Where is his books today? We don't have them. But Armenians have few of them. Other people have them. But we have never been subject to them. Those books were preserved by Scythian and Armenian priests. But Noah was Armenian loved priests. and respected by everyone. Scythians called. Now look at the, the spirals. Now look at the, the artwork. The symbols. Tim the Scythian's Otages, which means Great Patriarch, Sovereign Priest, and Mighty Sacrificer. And so he was the first, he was the one of the first great patriarchs, the, the priest, the holy priest, like Moses, right? When Moses came to America, Mesh, Meshi, um, Moshe, and he created the Meshika nation, and they called him Kutsukoto, High Priest. And every high priest after that had the name Kutsukotu. Barosis affirms that he also instructed astrology and course of the planets and divided years into 12 months. He was the creator of lunar calendar. So he is the creator of this lunar calendar our, our, our people go by. My Hawaiian people go by the lunar calendar. My Kishé people go by the lunar calendar. All my people went by this lunar calendar. He was the great patriarch, the sovereign priest, and mighty sacrificer. Didn't our people give offerings to the creator? Sacrifices? Uh, he also Fresh instructed fruits. them how to forecast the coming weather of succeeding years. Armenian Stonehenge. I just showed you the video of the Hawaiian Stonehenge. 
I just showed you the wooden stone hinge in the man crew. People were surprised with his knowledge. Some even thought that he deserves the same honor as God, and for that reason, he is called Holy Barma and Arthur, meaning heaven and sun. The virtue of our true God, they even gave name of Noah and his wife to many places. Look, he is called Oli Bama and our son, meaning heaven and sun, the virtue of the true God, the creator. They even gave a no, name of Noah and his wife to many places and cities. So just like Moses, like Moscow, Mexico, these places were named after Noah and his wife. In cities, they were honored for their virtues and knowledge of God. Noah instructed them agriculture and tillage of the ground, and the usage of grape seeds and how to plant vines and other things for better living. For that reason they called him Janus, which means giver of... So he was the agriculture instructor. He taught how to farm, where the, where the hunter gathers, but we farm. Our basis for everything is farming. But when you, you don't have the crops ready, you have to re you have to use your your hunting skills in order to survive. That's why our people taught which meats are good.